The disciples are having a sight problem. As close as they are to Jesus, as up close as they are to Jesus, as often as they're walking with him, being with him, sitting with him, watching him teach, watching him preach, watching him heal, they do not know what's up. They don't know what time it is. And the stories uh, in Mark's gospel are put here to illustrate this kind of sense of not knowing or this blindness. Take, for example, the story of James and John, two disciples, sons of Zebedee. They take, uh, take their time and walk to Jesus and say, hey, can you do something for us? And Jesus says, what do you want from me? And they say, can you put one of us on your right hand and one of us on your left hand? Can you put us in the seats of power when you come into your kingdom? Yeah, that's not what Jesus is about at all. But that's what they ask. In fact, in this section of Mark's gospel, there are two stories of healing. One is a man who's blind, wants to be healed. Uh, Jesus spits in the mud. You know that story? Puts some mud. I don't know if I want Jesus spitting on my eyes. But anyway, Jesus spits in the mud, puts some spit on the eyes. Can you see now? And the, and the man says, I, I can see the people, but they look like trees. So then Jesus touches them again, his eyes, and then he can fully see. That sense of partial sight in that story is a metaphor for the disciples' partial sight. In fact, the disciples know so little about what Jesus is doing that lots of my friends call the disciples the the disciples. They're pretty thick. And it isn't like it gets better. <laughs> All the way through the gospel, they misunderstand what Jesus is about. And when we get to the end of Mark's gospel, the, the real ending, the first ending, the disciples watch Jesus on the cross and turn tail and run. They're not even sticking around because they don't understand what's happening. But then there's Bartimaeus, Bar meaning son, Timaeus being his name. Let's call him Tim, because that's shorter. Then there's Tim, absolutely can't physically see, but has insight about who Jesus is. What does he know? He's heard the stories around the way. He's heard that Jesus is a healer. Without being able to see him, when Jesus is coming by, Tim's like, Yo, son of David, uh, can you heal me? <laughs> Have mercy on me. And he's so loud and disruptive that the crowd is like, shh. And so he gets louder. Hey, son of David, I need you to heal me. And sure enough, Jesus responds, bring him to me, call him to me. And this blind man jumps up springs up, the, the text says, throws off his cloak, which means throwing off his old outfit, like his blind people outfit, right? Ready for the new thing that Jesus has for him, and he's healed. Now, I, I don't mean to be hard on the disciples, because sometimes I can't see. I can't. Sometimes I can't see when I'm in a conversation with somebody who broke my heart when I was nine years old and kept breaking it until I was 50, still breaking it now, a relationship. I can't see that that person's hurting me because they're hurt. And I can't see that our healing might be about like just letting it go, like we're never going to be able to fix it, you know? Sometimes I can't see that when I'm trying to love on John, my, hus my husband, <laughs> I can be such a royal pain in his behind. I'm like, who are you? You're watching yourself. You're like, shut up. But it's like, Honey, did you put on sunscreen? You know you need to put on some sunscreen. You know you, you, know you, you, know you need to put it on. You know the doctor said, but I'm grown. I'm 73 years old, grown. Leave me alone. Did you drink water today? You know, like, ugh, like just, ugh, 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 up his butt. I can't see that that kind of love actually pushes him away. And sometimes, 
at least over the time of my life, I have fully not been able to see how me being a Christian, growing up in a Christian life, has helped cause some of the junk that's happening in the world. I haven't been able to see it. I can see it better, but it's still partial sight that every time I sung gospel songs like, you are the way, the truth, and the only light, no one comes to the Father but by me, I was participating in the way Christianness oppresses the world. I think we, none of us can fully see that the things we learned as young people about God have sometimes caused the church to be a problematic institution. We say ours is the only way, Jesus is the only path, and that causes us, caused us to torture Muslims in the Crusades to convert them to the way of love. Somebody say that ain't right. We can't see that the faith we inherited from our families that had built into it exclusion. Ain't nobody going to heaven but, you know, 144,000 of us that look just like us, that worship just like us, that believe just like us, that actually caused the Holocaust. It's 80 years ago, November 8th and 9th, where a program is started to gather up Jews and begin to put them in concentration camps in the name of Jesus, who was himself a Jew. Sometimes we can be blind to the way our faith, the way that we've been taught that God is coming into the world that puts no in the world. No, you're not a part of this. No, you can't do this. No, this is not of God. The literal interpretation of the Bible causes us caused people to feel like it was okay to hate gay people, which then caused it to be okay to pistol whip a boy named Matt Shepard and leave him out in the cold for 18 days to die. Do you understand what I'm saying? Our theology, our sense of how to be Christian has caused us to be anti-Semitic, not you and me in a personal way, but an institutional way. The Jews killed Jesus. The Jews deserve to die. That's what the man was reading on the website. The same kind of Christianness, it's not Christian, but the same kind of so called Christianness that led a man to look on websites and think, oh my God, they're against my God, Mr. Trump, and put together bombs and send them to people who are Trump's enemies. Do you understand what I'm saying? Is the same kind of Christianness that causes a man to think he should go in a synagogue and shoot up a people who are practicing their own faith in the name of love. We have got to stop being blind to how our own faith can be complicit in creating systems that oppress and hurt and kill. It's our faith that won't let go of gay as a problem. What the, what the hell? <laughs> I, I'm, I've been running around the country preaching and teaching and trying to talk about love and justice. And I got to a, a beautiful college, Eastern University in Pennsylvania. This is a gorgeous um, university raising faith-filled leaders. They're, they're, they're mentored by Tony Campolo. The children are smart and they're thinking about justice. And I'm in a classroom talking to some students and a professor and the, and the students are looking at our video where we're all marching on the pride thing. And they say, I'm confused by that. And I, and I go, what's your confusion? I know, but what's your confusion? <laughs> what, what has you confused about that? How do, we jo- how do we reconcile what the scripture says and, the, and this gay thing? And I go, that's a great question. How do you reconcile eating shrimp cocktail? Because the text also says don't eat the shellfish. (laughs) And how do you reconcile me talking in church? I'm talking in church. (laughs) How do you reconcile Emancipation Proclamation with 
slaves obey your masters. <laughs> Holla. I said, we're always, if we're in a good space, moving forward in our faith, understanding scripture in new ways, thinking about what it can't possibly mean, that, that doesn't make any sense because we love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So this professor was furious with me <laughs> for... <laughs> Go Fury for introducing and really tripping because I say everybody, gay, straight, bi, trans, all the bodies created by God just exactly as they are, becoming fully who they are. Oh, they wanted to stone me. Okay. I go to another classroom and it's a beautiful, the honors class. The children are really super smart and we're talking and they're coming along with me. I say, we're talking hermeneutics. They know that word because they're the honors kids. We're talking, we're talking about the lens through which we look at scripture. Let's talk about the lens. Can you look at the lens through love? Or do you look at it through judgment? They're like, yes. And I'm feeling good. They're nodding. Yes. I get that. And then one little sweet girl raises her hand and says, that, that really makes sense to me. But, holy but, but, <laughs> how do we convert them? Ooh. How do we evangelize them? And I said, that's not your job. <laughs> your job when you're talking to that girl in a hijab is to just tell stories and talk about your life and listen to her life and talk about how she loves God and talk about how you love God and move on. The rest is God's business. Yes, We're not in the business. <laughs> now look, I grew up in a house where I was taught that's exactly my business. Don't, don't, don't think I was, didn't. You're supposed to know that you're a Christian, you're supposed to know you're saved, and you're supposed to, in love, go save other people. With your story and with your thing and your four laws and the things, all the things. I remember taking evangelism class in seminary and thinking, I can't really do this. I, can't, I don't feel called to go in the world to convert people to Christianity. I feel called to go in the world and convert people to love. <laughs> to love, period. <laughs> to love, period. I'm still, I'm still partially blind. I can't pretend like I know all the things, because I don't. I know lots of things, but I don't know all the things. But I do know this. The God of love is not on the team of violence and killing and maiming and torturing and stressing to get people in our worldview. To love means to honor where people are at, to honor their faith life, to honor their faith practice, to understand their love. One of our congregants wrote me recently and said, Reverend Jackie, I can't square your, I can't square your love, period, with Jesus is the only way. Okay, I can. Because I understand that these scriptures of, inclus of exclusivity happen in the, as the church is trying to become itself. In other words, it's the early church trying to create a community and it creates an identity against other identities, right? This is the way, come this way. This is the way, that's what happens. So we can be back in the ancient times trying to act like we need to make an oppositional identity against the others of God's people, or we can open our eyes and see our God is bigger, badder, more amazing than we could ever ask or imagine and doesn't need our puny little boxes and our little short shut doors to grow a kingdom for herself. She don't need our little biases and prejudices and things to grow a kingdom for herself. She doesn't. She doesn't need us to decide who's in and out for, for, for her to do her work in the world. She needs us to love each other. Love each other. Love each other. So I'm mad as hell about the violence that's happening in the world. And I don't even want us to return that anger and madness with Violence, that's crazy. That's not going to fix it. 
What's going to fix it is for us to decide to be disciples of love, not the disciples of exclusion, but disciples of love, students of love, so that all of the people we encounter can have their eyes opened to what love can do in our individual lives and in our culture. It's understandable, really, to want to be in a tribe by ourselves. It's understandable, with so much going on, that we want to find our own kind. You are my own kind. You are my own kind. No matter who you love, no matter how you look, no matter your gender performance or identity, no matter how you think of God, you are my kind because you're human kind. Period. Period. And the only antidote to hate is love. The only way we, each of us, can heal the crap is to acknowledge our complicence in it. And if we are at a table at Thanksgiving participating in the they, the us, we're participating in the mess. If we're at a table acting like only God can only come through our lens, through our door, we're participating in the mess. It's a short distance, short distance, from Jesus is the only way to shoot the people in the synagogue. It's too short a distance for me. It's a short distance from the Muslims or infidels to let's torture them and convert them. And it's a short distance when it comes the other way. But I'm talking to y'all, my people. <laughs> Love is the gospel of Jesus the Christ. Love, period. And in each of our own sphere of influence, everywhere we tweet, everywhere we talk, everywhere we live, we can love people into a new worldview, and that's our job, and that's my ask. Sign the cards, give to the caravan, but mostly, mostly love us into healing. Can you do that? Yes. Will you do that? Yes. Amen. There's a little more to the sermon. Just hang on one second. <laughs> From a distance, we all have enough, and no one is in need. There are no guns, no bombs, no. watching us from a distance from a distance you look like my friend even though we are at war from a distance cannot comprehend what all this fighting is for. From a distance there is harmony and it echoes through the land. It's the hope of hopes. It's the love of love. It's the heart of every man. It's the hope of hope.
loves. It's the love of loves. It's the heart of every man. God is watching us. God is watching us. God is watching us from a distance. God is watching us. God is watching us. God is watching.